So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day two of this conference of the avant-garde of uh, architecture and avant-garde architecture. The first session will be moderated by um, Jan Sautig, Marek Fabik and Wojciech Bonenberg. So welcome, gentlemen, welcome all, um, um, welcome our audience, and I would like to invite you to the first lecture today. Thank Good morning. You. Good morning to everybody. Uh,
Dear ladies and gentlemen, because of the digital form of this presentation, we need to change a little bit the format of our uh, session because we cannot talk to our speakers live. So we may comment upon these notions in here by bringing this discussion in here. I don't know if any of the professors would like to share the views with us. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. As Professor has said, we may only add a few comments to what has been said and maybe think about the deeper meaning of what we have heard. It seems to me that the paper that uh, has been presented just a while ago the key thing that provokes the reflection is the very convention of this paper which refers strongly to the economical, political, existential issues. That means the matters that maybe 198 years ago was the key point of focus of the avant-garde of that time. So the fact that today we start thinking about these matters so instrumental to our daily lives again seems to be uh, hope-provoking. And at the same time, it is a reference to this very same avant-garde tradition, obviously in the new forms that respond to new social needs, all of the aspects that were underlined by our speaker. So the new role of architecture in our super commercialized world of today. So it is a paper that's full of reflection on the condition of contemporary architecture, but also on the condition of our lives. Maybe one of you, some of you would like to comment upon this paper. It seems to me that we are, mm -hmm. we are staying within the very same space. Uh, yesterday, we said that contemporary architecture tried to identify these aspects of innovation in composition that affects citizens and residents in urban areas. We listened to a very interesting paper on a highly sophisticated, sophisticated uh, idea of a set scene that corresponds to some imagined uh, landscape that is realized in a virtual world, in the world of film. And here the perspective is somewhat reversed. So we need to resolve contradictions that arise from certain social processes, the memory of the space and the tension between what citizens want and how a city is designed, maybe a carrier for the avant-garde in itself. So if there are no other comments, oh, well, nothing, um, not much can be added, but let me sum up that despite everything, when we present contemporary avant-garde in the context of the future, we cannot liberate ourselves from the memory of the past. So even though architecture tries to construct its own reality, the memory of the past still remains. 
and residents want to feel that they belong, that they own a space that has some history and that also um, was the shared space in the past. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are ready to move on to the next paper, and this time it is Professor Elena Olinik from Kiev, and her paper is entitled Soviet Modernism in Ukraine Comparative Analysis. Good morning, dear colleagues. Good morning, dear colleagues and dear guests. Thank you for the invitation and uh, congratulations to uh, such great uh, event. Uh, uh, the theme of my presentation will be uh, aspects of uh, modernism in uh, Ukraine. Uh, it is uh, believed that uh, uh, the USSR introduced three original architectural styles in world architecture. Constructivism, the, the Stalin Empire, and finally Soviet modernism. The least studied and least loved, but no less in interesting. But was Soviet modernism really an original uh, style, and how did it differ from Western prototypes? Modernism became the leading current in the artistic culture of a number of European countries. France, Italy, Germany, Ukraine and uh, Russia and uh, uh, already at the beginning of the um, 20th century. However, the 20s and 30s were the real flowering of modernism. There are three periods of modernism, early, developed and late, in the Soviet Union and Ukraine, constructivism of the uh, 2030s and late modernism uh, of uh, the 60s, 80s were the most expressive. The style of modernism in Europe originated from f f Futurism, which arose in 1909 after the publication of Manifesto of Italian uh, writer uh, Marinetti, which proclaimed the destruction of the past and the cult of uh, the future. Uh, no less radical uh, 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 rationalism replaced futurism uh, in Italy. The main ideologist of rationalism, Giuseppe Terani, imaginated uh, a new environment free from the remnants of the past, extremely functional, suitable for collective work and leisure. It is interesting that outside uh, uh, Italy, modernist architects as a rule well adherents of communist or simply left-wing uh, uh, beliefs, while Terani and uh, his six associated professed fascist ideology. In Ukraine, at the beginning of the 20th century and later in the USSR, the appearance and uh, the formation of the avant-garde was closely connected with Ukrainian artists. First of all, uh, Kazimir Malevich, Vladimir Tatlin, Alexander Arkhipenko, Alexander Bogomazov belonged to, to uh, them. The artistic schools of uh, Murashko, Exter in, in Kyiv, uh, Podgorodetsky, Novokivsky in Lviv, Arkhipenko in Berlin, and Paris, uh, Boychuk in Paris also became the basis uh, for the formation of avant-garde thinking. Volodymyr Tatlin, uh, who in 1913-1914 created a number of corner reliefs, is considered the founder of constructivism. The scale uh, achieved by constructivist uh, uh, movement is largely due to Vladimir Tatlin. The second phase of constructivism dates back to the post-revolutionary period in Ukraine and Russia, and it is all also associated with Tatlin's name. It is marked by the project of the monument of the Sword International created by him, Tatlin's Tower. 
in, made in 1919-1920. Uh, <clears throat> here, constructivism uh, is already subordinated to, to a specific utilitarian goal, the embodiment of the revolutionary ideology of the Bolsheviks. And until the end of the existence in the USSR, beginning of the 30s, it maintains its attachment to this ideology. Uh, constructivism as a direction was formed in the mid-20s of the 20th century, and after the uh, First World War, it occupied one of the main places in the architecture. The creativity of artists uh, who uh, uh, saw in new constructions and materials in simple geometric forms uh, devoid of the course new aesthetic possibilities and the basis for the formation of new styles uh, had a great influence uh, on architecture in the first year after the Bolshevik uh, coup. So Malevich's uh, suprematist painting and his three-dimensional architectural models prawns, prawns, became a symbol of the approval uh, of a new style. Transfer uh, station from painting to architecture. In uh, 1923, Malevich began to create architectons, model, uh, models consisting of plaster blocks in the form of cubes and parallelepipeds, merging with each other in at right angels. In particular, um, uh, it was uh, Kazimir Malevich's architecton which inspired Zaha Hadid on the topic of her diploma project. Uh, after the Russian Revolution, new social orders made it necessary to uh, develop new design prototypes. And on the global scale of the quarter, districts and city, judging by everything, the more radical and social transformations were in society, the larger the space. So, enlarger the housing blocks uh, with uh, 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 developed public infrastructure, kindergartens, uh, uh, laundries, parks, playgrounds, had become a new prototype in Red Vienna, in Berlin, uh, and London. Uh, there were areas of new residential development for workers. In the uh, USSR, the new urban spaces were the grandest. The vastness of open spaces in the Soviet Union is matched uh, by the scale of cultural and economic change. Peter Wilson uh, has described as finding uh, a strategy to legitimize empty space. At the end of uh, 1920s and the beginning of 1930s, uh, uh, constructivism and rationalism gradually spread in Ukraine as advanced directions in architecture and, first of all, in urban planning. The reconstruction of the cities of Ukraine was influenced uh, by the theoretical developments uh, of Milutin, who borrowed the ideas of Arturo Soria Imata, proposing a linear scheme where the urban uh, area was zoned uh, into parallel strips. According to this scheme, uh, from uh, 1929 to 1932, uh, the so-called social, socialist city, Big Zaporizhia, was built. Famous Russian constructivist architects work on the project. There was, in general, an ideal situation for them here. A relatively flat uh, terrain, uh, the absent the absence, as it was believed, of previous buildings, the existing uh, Cossack settlements were not considered an obstacle. On the contrary, they were precisely the goal of destruction for the Soviet authorities. And so far, a, liber a, a relatively liberal regime, which at uh, the time uh, was still flirting with the constructivists. Uh, represent, representatives of Germany, France, the USA, and other countries took part in the design. In total, four teams worked uh, of, on city planning under the leadership uh, of uh, Shusev, Visnin, Malaziomov, Sakulin, and others. 
The town consisted of uh, six town planning entities, which uh, are still called uh, which are still uh, called villages. Uh, the quarter by quarter buildings principle was used for the first time uh, in Ukrainian architecture and socialist city. Each quarter in which from uh, uh, 500 to 3,000 people were supposed to live had an original structure and composition. The most famous complex uh, of buildings uh, in Ukraine of this period is Dezprom or House of State Industry in Kharkiv from 1927. Rising to 12 stories and uh, occupying the biggest part of Kharkiv's uh, circular uh, uh, Dzerzhinsky Square, now Freedom Square, it became a symbol of constructivist architecture in Ukraine. The game with contrast of volumes, materials and pure forms became the main thing of architecture of constructivism. Walking clubs, uh, a palace of culture, bus parks, department uh, stores, communal houses were built in this concept. The work of Soviet constructivists uh, exemplified the optimism of new world uh, order the con and continues to influence architectural discourse today. Constructivism and modernism became the embodiment of a new identity. This was manifested even in uh, sacred buildings. In particular, inter interesting examples of this style have been preserved in Rivne, Sarne, Sakal, and etc. For all the social and economic dislocation and later uh, the world economic crisis, the period between two world wars in Volinia was marked uh, by a number of significant achievements in uh, architecture. Uh, for uh, Polish uh, uh, historians and architects, it was a period of hope, of uh, certain ups, uh, upswing. You can see interesting objects in Volin and uh, Lviv and uh, uh, Rivne region from this period. In Kyiv, which struggled with the establishment of Bolshevik power until 1921, constructivism appeared much later and gradually passed into Stalinist empire. Architects who believed in left-wing ideology were involved in the construction. Among them, uh, Pavlo Alyoshin, uh, Alexander Verbitsky. Alyoshin used uh, rounded elements in constructivist buildings, which are also characteristic of Eric Mendelssohn's work. Several buildings with rounded uh, corners were built in uh, Kyiv during 1928-1936. However, the relative liberalism of constructivist, uh, constructivism in the uh, 20s on the imperial soil of the USSR did not last long. Uh, the post-war period in Western architecture was marked uh, by a blossoming of modernism. The early experimentation uh, of constructivists in the USSR in the 1920s had transformed into an international style. Modernism was a continuous search for the new, new technologies, new materials, new typologies. It was based on rationalism and rejected the view of architecture as an aesthetic practice. But in the Soviet Union, architecture was still considered a part of art, and as all other art forms was a sort of performance intended to carry the ideological message of the Soviet state. The decree against excesses in architecture was issued in November 1955. Triumphal classic uh, elements, once to kingpin of uh, socialism, were out. The government directed architects to search for other means of glorifying the regime. 
At first, the fight against excesses was applied only to residential architecture. <laughs> Embellishment were no longer uh, allowed in uh, on apartment buildings. With time, the country's leaders realized that the use of ornamentation, ornamentation must be stopped on all fronts. It was decreed that the current so socialism in architecture demands that architects explore advanced, uh, adv advanced experience from abroad. Since the Soviet Union uh, still remained a closed society, technology transfer uh, through the usual means <coughs> of international communication with colleagues abroad was not uh, an option. But uh, Western architectural magazines were apparently thought uh, to be harmless. Seemingly overnight, they appeared in libraries. Soviet architects were not able to see in print the works of leading Western architects such as Le Corbusier, Miss Van der Rohe, Louis Kahn, Alvar Alta, and others. But they could only study them on paper. They had no access to the actual buildings, uh, to the building technologies uh, uh, involved, or the complex uh, economic forces that produced this architecture. Since they could only see images. They interpreted the party's aim in a very creative way. Instead of copying the classical style, they now copied the modern style. style. Uh, so, highly praised and advertised as a symbol of Khrushchev's soul, the palace of pioneers in Kyiv is still called today as an example of Soviet modernism. It really impresses with its cosmic lines, slender uh, proportion. Uh, most of interior spaces, uh, uh, space of <coughs> palace of pioneers is taken up by public areas, the lobby, oversized halls uh, and hallways. This serves an ideological uh, purpose. The building scale projects a glorified uh, image of uh, the state, or in this case, the pioneers, uh, the young wing uh, of the Communist Party. However, the functional areas uh, of the building, those where the children spend most of their time, sport facilities, work, arts and performance spaces, are disproportionately small, as if on different scale compared to the public uh, areas. However, Soviet architects uh, could not simply continue copying Western works. They last, they, their task was to glorify the Soviet system, <coughs> and forms alone uh, were not enough. Uh, since the doctrine of socialism in architecture included a synthesis of arts, the formal elements of Western modernist architecture were complemented by all kinds of embellishment. Sculptural relief and mosaic panels, murals, freestanding sculpture, etc. The party conveniently forgot that embellishments ha uh, had been banned for economic reasons. In the late 1950s, uh, Western architects uh, turned away from the simplicity of Bauhaus-inspired international style toward more complexity exploration of so-called brutalism. Brutalism was a style in architecture of late modernism, the main characteristic of which was the identification of architecture of buildings with the help of bare structure and the use of natural textures of materials. Many supporters of brutalism, as well as constructivism at one time, professed socialist views and singled out among, among uh, its adventures not only the relative cheapness uh, of construction, but also, but also uncompromising anti-bourgeois and honestly. In the Soviet Union, brutalism appeared very late in the 1980s and practically uh, supplanted pure modernism. The influence of brutalism was uh, evident in Ukrainian architecture of the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, 
formal elements of uh, brutalism were used along uh, uh, with canons of the socialist realism in uh, architecture. Uh, in practically, it did not affect uh, the appearance of resident buildings, but it is clearly represented uh, uh, in public buildings. At the same time, the concept of regionalism was developed according to which it was pro proposed to use the characteristic of uh, one or another region. Perhaps the first time in the history of Soviet architecture, the building was considered as a part of complex united with surrounding territories. A beautiful examples of late Soviet modernism has been preserved in Kyiv, Kharkiv uh, and other Ukrainian cities. They were characterized by uh, working with environment, uh, shaping uh, the surrounding space, bright dynamics, uh, of forms and uh, a certain uh, decorativeness. Uh, starting of the mid uh, 1960s, a new Soviet architectural lexicon of socialism appeared. It included uh, large scale portals taking up the entire facade and made up of endless rows of vertical tips, ribs. Alia Finnish architects uh, Alvaro Alto, for example, Ukrainian Palace of Culture architect uh, uh, Evgenia Marinchenko. The second monumental covered entrances uh, to public buildings made uh, of rectangular or, and circular arches, such as Cherkasy Regional Museum of Local History uh, and others in different regions of USSR. Uh, the sword, uh, deliberate and crudely made enormous overhanging uh, sun shields, Alaran Shamp and Chandigarh uh, Le Corbusier project from 1950s, as uh, um, uh, theater of musical comedy in Odessa and uh, uh, Kievska Rus uh, uh, cinema in Kiev. This vocabulary was used in the USSR in all types of structure, residential and institutional buildings, worker, uh, workers' club and palaces, palaces of pioneers, sport facilities, museums and others. All these were designed using formal elements of Western architecture. Uh, thus, the image of uh, Salut Hotel in Kyiv uh, refers us to metabolism style and remind us the Nakajin Towers in Tokyo from 1972. Similar designs with floors strung on central support were popular in the 60s. The Kiev Television Center building uh, resembles the Knights uh, of Columbus Tower in New Haven, uh, USA. The buildings were erected using the similar technologies. Another landmark of modernism is located near the TV Center, the Institute of International Relations and the Institute of Journalism. It was some slides before this one. Uh, the architecture of uh, the Kharkiv National uh, uh, Academy uh, is the Kharkiv Na National Academic Theater is built uh, on the contrast of the large overhanging slab uh, of the uh, two upper floors and uh, the complex plastics of lower lobbies, foyers and others. Uh, externally, uh, it somewhat resembles Boston City Hall. One of the most uh, famous uh, uh, buildings of Kyiv modernism uh, uh, is uh, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, Institute uh, uh, of uh, uh, I'm sorry. Ukrainian Institute of uh, uh, Scientific and Technical Information, uh, architects Lev Novikov and Florian uh, uh, Yuryev. Uh, 
According to the plan, the room which resembled a spaceship was to become a unique color music theater where it would be possible to hold musical performances to the play of color gradients on the light screen. The authors were inspired. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. The authors were inspired by the work of the Brazilian modernist Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, the modernist ensemble of uh, the Kyiv National University, named after Taras Shevchenko, uh, is also unique. Each building of the faculties of kybernetic, uh, radiophysics and mechanics and mathematics is decorated with an original bas relief symbolizing the main direction of the faculty. The memorial park, designed by monumentalist artists uh, Rybachuk and Milnichenko, was recognized as the best project of the year at the Kyiv Project Competition. The outer, above-ground part of the crematorium buildings is made up of two reinforced con concrete shells, inside of which there are forever holes. A rare example of an organic direction of modernism for Kyiv the crematorium gives the impression of mysterious portal to another uh, world. Works of the giant bas relief of the wall of remembrance, 213 meters long, lasted uh, seven years only. Uh, his main motif was the uh, life uh, uh, path from birth to death, which every person must uh, inevitably go through. But in, 19, uh, 90, uh, in 1982, by the decision of Communist Party, the base relief was destroyed and completely filled with concrete. Only on August 11, uh, uh, 2021, the restoration of this remembrance wall uh, reliefs began. So, uh, for conclusion, a modernism which emerged in the first half of the 20th century was the dominant style after World War II until 1980s. One of the features of Soviet and Ukrainian modernism was precisely the work of architects not with objects but with the environment. Uh, however, today these objects are under threat of destruction uh, or uh, complete reconstruction. Joint efforts of researchers and preservationists are necessary for its preservation and inclusion in the modern context of the city. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Sorry for later. Bardzo dziękujemy za ten ciekawy wykład pokazujący, jak awangarda inspiruje architektów na całym świecie. Which explained and shows how avant-garde is inspiring for architects all over the world about the currents and trends and how they flow across the, uh, the globe uh, um, because of difficulties with uh, uh, the to, with our schedule and uh, let us move on to the next uh, presentation Federica Visconti from Naples um, so it's avant-garde thinking of architecture through drawings Madame, the floor is yours I'm going to share my screen in order to present my speech about avant-garde uh, starting from the definition of uh, the term avant-garde, the origin of the term is related to the military field, as we always know. Uh, it indicates the military unit that in navy or army precedes all the others. From here, there is obviously a figurative use of the term avant-garde. 
that uh, denotes the act of proceeding with greater commitment and more decisiveness of the other, assuming a kind of guide uh, role. Uh, obviously, uh, the term uh, have a different meaning in the field of art, and uh, avant-garde uh, defines movements that propose new poetics and new um, way of uh, expression, in contrast, usually, uh, with the current uh, test. Uh, this is the reason why in the official histories of architecture, there are uh, many different uh, kind of uh, avant-garde, as we know. The German expressionism, the Russian uh, constructivism, the Dutch neoplasticism, and for example in Italy, the futurism, and um, in some way we can consider a kind of avant-garde also the rationalism. Um, images very, very famous that uh, don't need a comment, uh, but um, I think I, I don't want to propose you uh, this historical connotation of avant-garde, um, where the suffix ism uh, from the ancient Greek added to a noun or to an adjective indicates uh, um, artistic movement. I would uh, like to go to the ideological connotation of avant-garde uh, that uh, due to its uh, aesthetic and political nature uh, propose an, a kind of a priori vision of reality. Um, and uh, intend the reality as a whole and actively work to transform the reality. So in this sense, what I would like to uh, show to you um, will be some uh, works of art or works of architecture that with uh, Renato Capozzi uh, we uh, developed uh, in the last two years, during a different period, uh, pandemic before and then the awful condition of the war in our Europe, um, that we think in some way um, explored the connection between drawing and artistic representation of architecture and architecture in uh, itself, and are um, connotated by this uh, ideological idea of avant-garde to look at reality and try to uh, say something to uh, transform it. Uh, the first work is um, at uh, the origin of this uh, reasoning, uh, following an invitation of two friends, uh, Federico Bilò and Riccardo Palma, in the first art uh, lockdown in Italy, uh, to, uh, to represent uh, the space of uh, inhabiting. Um, in this uh, very uh, special condition that uh, COVID uh, uh, was. And for us, Memento Virus, this is the title of the work, um, was a, a way to uh, think uh, of a culture of inhabiting during the pandemic, going to the origin of uh, culture of inhabiting. 
So an enclosure um, as the way to cut a piece of reality and protect uh, it from uh, the exterior uh, nature in order to protect the life of the human being, but an enclosure where um, the columns um, can uh, in this way establish um, a relationship between the continuity of the wall and the tectonic arrangement of a kind of hypostyle hole. Uh, also the materials uh, underlying this different connotation of the two way of construction, marble for the continuity of the wall and the white, probably steel, I don't know, or concrete, uh, for the columns that are in a kind of um, progressive uh, series uh, with different uh, um, diameters and different uh, disposition. And this is a way for us to uh, reason on the uh, a, an archetypical condition of inhabiting in the enclosure that uh, um, define a duality uh, facing uh, the nature. And this is our last drawing uh, where the, uh, the nature uh, out of the enclosure uh, was our um, landscape with the Vesuvius. Uh, one year after, we were invited by Franco Purini and uh, Enrico Anzaloni um, in another exhibition uh, where the theme was exactly the relationship between um, architecture and other arts. The question uh, by the editor of the exhibition uh, was to try to uh, represent uh, a work of art inside another work of art, probably a work of architecture. And in some way we develop uh, the same uh, reasoning uh, with the um, work called The Wall Inside the Wall. Um, and again, um, a reasoning uh, about interior and exterior uh, speciality in the culture of uh, inhabiting. Um, so a pavilion uh, with two uh, U-shaped uh, wall. Uh, but again, the possibility to see uh, the nature uh, out of the enclosure. And the work of art inside our work of architecture was um, a sculpture of uh, Mario Negri uh, called The Wall, that is a um, bronze sculpture uh, with uh, human figures uh, on a basement but represented in their uh, real dimension uh, and so we we would like to imagine that after the end of pandemic uh, the man on the basement uh, can go out and restart to uh, inhabit uh, the world. And this is the poster of the exhibition that uh, a year uh, after the end of uh, lockdown um, has been exhibited uh, in a beautiful 
palazzo in uh, Trevi. But uh, this is probably the third uh, work, uh, probably uh, the most political uh, of the three uh, works. Uh, the title is uh, A Wall Opened to Let the Columns Pass. So always a wall, also the columns, but in order to say something different, um, after the explosion of the war in Europe, uh, in order to answer to another invitation by uh, Giovanni Menna, and Olga Starodubova uh, that decided to uh, invite architects to um, produce a drawing, a work of art, uh, under this slogan, make um, architecture, uh, not war. Well, I have to say that uh, uh, there were in the exhibition many beautiful drawings. Uh, in some cases, um, that uh, pointed uh, the attention on the destruction, on the ruins that the war uh, obviously uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, produced. Uh, we decided for another idea uh, in order to answer to the title of the exhibition, Make Architecture Not War. Uh, we think the architecture is uh, against uh, the war uh, because it is a, an optimistic discipline. Uh, his goal, its goal is to transform the world and obviously uh, to transform in order to make it better. So again, uh, a wall, but in this case the wall is uh, open and uh, different columns that represent in some way uh, the differences of the human being in terms of race, religion, and so on, uh, the, the different columns uh, represent uh, the difference of the human beings that uh, need to be able to live together looking at the nature uh, outside the wall that is not more a terrible, a terrifying, a terrific nature, but uh, a peaceful uh, condition of uh, inhabiting. And uh, this is the 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 final drawing for the exhibition uh, where the wall um, open uh, themselves to let the column pass. Uh, so uh, the three works uh, during uh, a difficult period of our life uh, suggested us to reflect on the fundamentals of architecture, but also of life, affirming the significant identity and unity between uh, two moments that in architecture are strictly related one to the other, that are composition and construction. And the works show how a constructive and conformative principle, the enclosure, can be integrated every time with the tectonic principle, the columns. Uh, so, three spaces, 
that uh, are not related to a practical function. Uh, so, unfortunately, not built, but thought only to meditate on the pure sense of inhabiting. Uh, spaces that found places and can be uh, different uh, one to the other, uh, but um, they in some way contrast the indefinite uh, character of nature with the finiteness, the limitation, exactness of relationship, even if they always turn towards the nature by opening, gaining elevated position and unprecedented uh, um, opportunities to overlooking. Uh, thank you very much. Bardzo dziękujemy. Oczywiście nie mamy możliwości bezpośredniego kontaktu. Thank you, thank you for this presentation. Unfortunately, we cannot speak to Professor Visconti directly, but let me add a comment. So this original interpretation of avant-garde by Professor's works created in teams with other colleagues, with other colleagues, other Italian architects. This presentation was a highly interesting example of the fact that architecture, avant-garde architecture, is alive, is well alive and is being redefined, remade whenever we need to respond to something, to some extraordinary situation that Professor Visconti was talking about. So we had a, an example of residential architecture dedicated to the pandemic period, an example of reflection on architecture and the current events in Europe. And we also had this broader reflection on what avant-garde can do to deal with contemporary challenges. So let me just add one more thing. I am impressed by the uh, presentation, visual presentation of the ideas uh, that Professor Visconti was talking about. We cannot forget that for architects, the visual language, the visual narrative is as important as the language, natural language spoken or written. And in this case, we could uh, observe this perfect case study of absolutely uh, ideal correspondence between the content and the visual presentation. So Professor Visconti referred directly to some actual situations, so um, what architecture really is, but at the same time referred to philosophy and commenting on the works we saw just a while ago, I believe that wall, wall became an important element of architecture because it means permanence, it means continuity, both spatially and in temporal terms. So architecture that uh, expresses the notes permanence is just the opposite of war is causing and that's the direct difference to what we are experiencing today. So all of the works were uh, that were presented by Professor Visconti were deeply rooted in contemporaneity and at the same time spoke of this need for continuity in all aspects of relationships between people and 
architecture. So, original thinking is often triggered in situations that uh, come about in response to some external factors. But as we also heard uh, before today, it also requires the strong language that allows us to verbalize our uh, ideas, our purposes, before we start to construct in the real realm of reality. And I believe that this is a great introduction to the final presentation today that will be presented by Professor Ewa Cisek from the Warsaw. And the title is The Avant-Garde of Architecture, Architectural Space Constructed Out of Imagination. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Architectural space uh, built uh, uh, of sound imagination and sculpture. Każda rzecz jawiłaby się człowiekowi taką, jaką jest. Everything should be perceived as it is. Współczesna architektura coraz częściej sięga po formy, oddające sobie dane przyjawy ekspresji świata, taki jak dźwięk, który jest wibracją oraz rzeźba, czerpiącą niejednokrotnie motywy ze świata surrealistycznego i rzeczywistości and of reality. Creating a built space of sound imagination and sculpture is a part of the era in which we currently live, that we is defined as post-modernity. This state of culture is characterized by the admission of um, various thoughts and, and forms to the creative process, while weakening the beliefs in one universal path of the world development. The utility, durability and beauty are irrelevant. Instead, a new door has opened, leading to the new areas of cognition and creation of architectural space that shifts, shifts the focus from the cognition of objective reality to a more subjective, sensual, and thus avant-garde cognition. One of these areas has become a space of sound imagination, which is a combination of sculpture, nature, and architecture, also referred to as a space of deep listening, which can take the form of a nature temple, and a studio, an instrument, and a bridge of sounds. Sound imagination is defined by Thomas Eliot, the author of Wasteland poem, as intuitive listening, which makes it possible for us to understand many perspectives for the manifestation of all being. It enables the viewer to notice the multidimensionality of the world as well as the multifaceted and relational nature of each constructed form, including the architectural one. Eliot, I believe that sound strengthens the power of words and creates a space for deep listening. Creation of an um, avant-garde poem filled with sounds is considered the foundation of modernism in architecture. The temples of nature, a perfect example of uh, this is uh, represented by transformation of forms which were formerly perceived as uh, uh, typically utilitarian. These are new temples of nature created by men for nature by means of skillful combination of sculpture during nature with architectural space. The latter usually creates a spatial frame and at the same time an acoustic environment of a studio character for the former two and generates a new quality of space which is defined by a space of intuitive sound of perception. To uh, illustrate that, we can see um, an installation by a talented Wrocław artist Alicja Patanowska and titled The Space of Sound Imagination. Uh, this work was exhibited as a part of the cyclical cultural event uh, Survival uh, Wrocław 2018. This uh, sound uh, installation, sculptural sound installation, is based on a ceramic vessel's resonators, a 12-second reverberation uh, of a historical interior of the pump hole and compositions of water drops falling from the vault.
Woda jako alternatywne środowisko Water as an alternative environment for spreading sound waves, also in the ways which are inaudible to humans, is a symbol of the hidden world. Sounds uh, form a vibration and they uh, are intermediaries in communication between men and uh, the environment. Men experience the surrounding sounds. Uh, the sound system, sound installation combined with the um, interior sound of the interior are uh, prompts towards more um, attentive listening. Quoting Patanowska and Drop becomes a prism through which we can see differently uh, than usual how the gamma glass measures uh, time, of which we have less and less. Uh, this is the necessary for proper functioning of living organism. Uh, so we can understand that in the form of, in the process of attentive listening. Uh, so the monumental space of the historic hall in combination with seven sculptures uh, changed its uh, um, purpose uh, and opens the user to the new reality. The space of sound imagination is, can, is also present in the Norwegian example of a layout in the house to die in uh, the house in Kiko. And this is a form which is an architectural experiment. The uh, construction of the object has been controversial for years, mainly due to its avant-garde form, which is an actual architectural experiment. And uh, again, we have small uh, dropping of uh, drops of rain. Uh, so we have this original assumption that creates uh, its own world, which does not uh, imitate the reality uh, or the future or the contemporary time, the world in search of subtlety. The space of sound imagination is na constantly present in natural rock formations such as caves and canyons. The avant-garde so solution of a rock church in Helsinki uh, presents the uh, activity of architects in deliberate action to obtain an interior with specific acoustic parameters. So that is always uh, connected and associated with a sacrum space. An instrument of a studio nature, the concept of post-modern and post-functional architecture is connected with the rejection of rationalist ideas of modernity. The special form is situated on the border of architecture and sculpture, taking over the feature of non-architectural objects and thus becoming their architectural representations. And so the sculptural form, which evolves in the direction of a musical instrument, obtains an interior, internal space Space, which is an interactive space with the audio sphere surrounding the objects. We can enter it and establish a good rapport with it by means of intuitive feeling of sound, both those of which we are authors and those coming from the outside. An interesting example here is an architectural shape uh, um, gigaphone, which was designed by a couple of architects uh, uh, in Trondheim, Brandeland uh, and Christopherson. It is a steel structure in the shape of a trans, uh, of a cone of a studio, uh, character, uh, character and supported by eight pillars. This avant-garde form on the border of architecture and sculpture can be compared to a gigantic musical instrument with an internal accessible space which reflects the pure timbre of its sound. And uh, for this reason, the interior of Gigaphone is used by musicians uh, so where they meet their tune their instruments and perform their favorite compositions. It is also the favorite space for children to play and for dogs to contemplate the tones in the interior, uh, which uh, are caused by living creatures, the movement and the sounds they create, as well as the wind, are amplified and directors. Moreover, spoke background noises such as echo, splatter, and murmurs are collected and the intended sound effect results from the a combination of three components, the material, the inner slope of the tube, which is covered with a glossy black furnish, and we have the resonator into one can um, uh, enter, 
and to immerse into this sound imagination. A separate and interesting group is represented by pavilions, which are equipped with motion sensors that generate sounds as a result of registering the slightest movement the object makes. The sound heard is not the amplified sound of someone's activity, but its multimedia counterpart. An example is the implementation called Echo um, from Denmark, made by Tilo Frank. The object is made of wood. It is a covered walking path which is full of open work, inviting us to forest bathing and walking in nature. Thanks to the installed sensors, each movement inside the structure generates a melodic motive. Each of the activities uh, can be uh, received in sound representation, so this term of architectural form is defined as an interactive structure when the sound which manifests its presence of life becomes the medium for modulation. Then we have architectural spaces by Lars Spoyenborg and composer Edwin von den Heide. And that is in the Netherlands, Sun or House, Sun Pavilion. And this is an architectural form in a form of a studio, of a studio nature with perfect acoustics for receiving music. And uh, it is also, in a way, a musical instrument in the confrontation with this pavilion. Um, each user of the pavilion uh, unavoidably takes part in creating uh, sounds and becomes a creator of new space uh, and um, imagination of uh, sound. The form Avalon is also avant-garde and its arced uh, structure is made of steel elements creating the shape of a blob with developed into dynamic lines of the body's arms and limbs. Uh, the bridge Martin of Heidegger sound, Martin Heidegger, at the defines the existence of certain architectural elements in the landscape, which result in the existence of a place, at the same time with all its components appearing uh, successively, uh, says that the bridge collects uh, the earth as a landscape around the stream. So, the banks are only only emerge as banks when the bridge crosses the stream. So we have a bridge like a structure made of sound. So that fits well into the concept of modern architecture when the space is located on the uh, threshold of architecture and uh, sculpture. So uh, we have Eve Heifen, uh, consisting of two spherical sculptural forms which are located on both banks of the river in Drammen, right next to Ypsilon pedestrian bridge. Shiny silver spheres reflect the surroundings like a mirror and collect sounds from the local ecosystem of the river. We can, as a end result, we can hear the rest of uh, the river and uh, the spirit, spirit of water is, is interchanging. The users crossing the bridge are immersed in these heavenly sounds, which often makes them stop and feel the sound spans intuitively. The second project is the art gallery called the Twist Museum by Bjarke Inge's group. Near Oslo. The avant garde structure in the form of a scul bridge sculpture was stretched over the Randselva River in the apparently silent scenery. So, the concept of uh, creating uh, of this uh, uh, link connecting these two areas, uh, the park of sculptures and the other bank of the river, was uh, achieved by the double curvature of the bridge museum facade which is formed by simple aluminium panels arranged like a pile of books. The grooved shape of the walls of the gallery interior creates a specific audio sphere which is filled with sound. The user's perception shifts from visual perception to attentive listening thanks to creation of a new quality of space which prompts an intuitive feel of sound.
zaprezentowane przykłady przestrzeni zbudowanej The presented examples of a built space, sound imagination and sculpture defined as a space of deep listening, a temple of nature, a studio, an instrument and a bridge of sound, despite that avant-garde character reflecting their basic assumption, the attitude of being in the world by perceiving ego, nature and culture as a combined whole. Naturze, która jest dachem kultury, Nature is the home of culture, because it is the root of the cultures and has all the patterns and vibrations and spatial organizations, including sounds and uh, sensual and non-sensual emanations. Professor, thank you so much for this interesting and uh, so complex presentation. I believe that architecture has always been connected with our senses. We've been perceiving architecture in so many different ways, and we continue to do so with uh, our until now. And over the past decades, we've been witnessing such efforts or of artists and architects who consciously want to emphasize the way in which our senses work, that the Philips uh, pavilion or the Cavoisier pavilions uh, together with Sanatis, well, they, they were built on the basis of music and sound of music, so that was the concept for the pavilion to have music. When it comes to architecture, Apart from uh, the purpose, apart from uh, uh, the use of uh, architecture, not to mention concert halls, uh, well, sculptures, artistic activities, that was all interconnected. So there was this very popular and very fashionable trend in sculpture. So can, um, sculptures uh, combined with music or the house to die that was mentioned in the lecture. I'm wondering whether it is somehow related to Okingara, the forest on suiciders, perhaps uh, that uh, result that has been inspired by uh, this uh, uh, Japanese forest uh, uh, which is uh, traveled by those those who want to meet their tragic end, although the house that we could see, which had been, um, which was initially designed as a residential house, it is not entirely uh, feeling uh, responding or uh, responding to its uh, original purpose. Professor, you're the expert here. Well, I don't really see myself as an expert uh, in artistic performances uh, bordering on uh, disciplines. But again, uh, it is emphasized that avant-garde way of thinking enjoys uh, um, clashes or contexts with some unusual concepts and some unusual requirements which uh, force us to look for non-standard solutions. In my opinion, well, not necessarily something which is expected to be an, to be avant-garde remains avant-garde because uh, the artistic audience uh, has this multi-sensual, multi-sense perception. So there could be a very pragmatic premise of uh, in reception of uh, of an object. So that can prompt us towards this concept of universal planning and respect respect to, to different ways of perception among members of a community. Well, I believe that when uh, uh, entering uh, 
uh, visiting of such uh, structures uh, that were described by uh, the speaker, well, that changes our way of um, um, thinking about uh, uh, the profession. We are we have uh, the site, we can see things, but we can also taste things, we can also smell things. So I suggest that we have a coffee break now and we'll start the next part of the session with a 15 minute delay uh, and we'll compensate it at the end of our today's session. I'm afraid Professor Kozłowski is not available uh, here right now. Uh, so I'll see you back um, at uh, half past. Thank you. Proszę Państwa, nadszedł czas, żeby rozpocząć kolejne spotkanie po przerwie kawowej. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the time has come for us to resume our session after the break. And now we will listen to a presentation by Professor Patrizio Martinelli entitled Escape from the Avant-Garde, the House as a Stage for Memory. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry for not being with you today, uh, but I thank the organizer to allow this uh, uh, possibility to have the online presentation. I'm Patrizio Martinelli from uh, uh, the Northumbria University in Newcastle uh, in the UK. My presentation is Escape from the Avant-Garde, the house a stage of memory. I think there has been a moment in the 20th century when with the intention of refounding from zero the artistic languages, Schomburg in music, modern in painting, a narrative has been developed in which symbols and meanings and history itself disappeared to start from scratch all over again. <clears throat> in these few words of the architect and academic Luciano Semerani, we see summarized one of the most relevant characteristics of the avant-garde and of the modern movement. In fact, it is well known how the modern movement proposed a refusal of any relationship with history, well represented by Bauhaus, that removed the teaching of history from its pedagogical problems. On the other hand, many modern movement masters and protagonists of avant-garde did not completely reject the past. For instance, Le Corbusier and Mies had strong connection with memory, history and tradition. My presentation focuses on these aspects how history and memory survived in the artistic, architectural and cultural discourse, sometimes informed a sort of escape from avant-garde and modernism, towards the refuge, the shelter, the protective realm, even as a theatrical stage of the domestic interiors. For ancient Roman rhetors, memory was one of the five parts of rhetoric and art uh, of recollection was a technique by which the orator could improve his memory, being able to deliver long speeches with reliable accuracy. As Frances Yates writes in her book, The Art of Memory, according to this technique used by Quintilian and Cicero, quote, the first step was to imprint on the memory a series of places. The most common type of mnemonic place system used was the architectural type. In order to form a series of places in memory, a building is to remember as spacious and varied as possible with the forecourt, the living room, bedrooms and parlors, not omitting statues and other ornaments with which the room are decorated. The images by which the speech is to be remembered are then placed in imagination on the places that have been memorized in the building." End of quote. After that, the orator would move in his imagination through his building, room after room, recalling in the right order images, concepts and topics, delivering the speech 
since the order is fixed by the sequence of places and buildings. The architectural mnemonic system was persistent during the Middle Ages and became very popular in Renaissance and since then this technique have often been used as a device to relate memory in places. In 1851, an American educator named Emma Willard created an historical timeline as an application of the classical art of memory that displays a classical temple with some parts of the floor, columns and ceiling marked with historical events. But also the whole city can become a memory device. According to historian Christine Boyer, we can read Napoleon III's urban redesign of Paris as an application of the classic card of memory, with the monumental staging of monuments and buildings, all connected by paths inside the urban fabric as a celebration of the collective memory and the heroic accomplishments of his directorship. I interpret similarly the remarkable moving Russian art by Andrei Sokurov, in which a narrator wanders through the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg the path is not only the opportunity to visit the spaces of the museum, but a walk in history and memory. In fact, in each room, he encounters real and fictional people from various periods in the city's 300-year history. Getting back to Renaissance, during the, those times, the memory system was disseminated through treatises that prescribed that the places to be used had to be houses but also churches, abbeys, and theaters. It is well known how the idea of theater informed the Renaissance interpretation of the world. Especially in the Venetian context, buildings and public spaces were often transformed in stages for the life of the city, in events like the carnival or the processions in St. Mark's Square that we see depicted in the painting of Bellini and Carpaccio, or thanks to the numerous theaters spread in the urban fabric. Renaissance scholar Dennis Cosgrove says, quote, the life of the Renaissance city was articulated, if not dominated, by spectacle, and was a mirror of a unified cosmos, the machine of the world, end of quote. Who speak was reached by the Olympic theater in Vicenza, designed by Palladio. In Venice, at the time, the philosopher Giulio Camillo built a memory theater, bringing together the classical memory techniques and the theatricality of humanist culture. It was not a full-scale building, though, but large enough to be entered by at least two people at once, a sort of large-scale wood cabinet or container in the shape of a theater. The theater der derived from the Vitruvian archetype and had seven steps, which were divided each into seven parts. Each step had different images and symbols that represented concepts, ideas, aspects of human knowledge and sculpture, and at the same time, they were a representation of the cosmos. Under each image, there were drawers and boxes containing papers with speeches by Cicero and related to the subjects of the images. The spectator had to stand on the stage looking towards this auditorium, gazing at the images on each of these sections, acquiring knowledge of the world and wisdom from the lesson of the past. I think it is interesting to see this connection between the classical techniques of recollection that I briefly summarized and architectural spaces and types, the theater in particular. Memory is not an instrument for surveying the past, but it's theater, Benjamin wrote. Remembrance must, in the strictness epic of the rhapsodic manner, a sight spade in ever new places and in the old ones delve to ever deeper layers." End of quote. It is evident how memory is an essential component of architectural space and of the interior, made of archaeological stratification and histories of the inhabitant molded into the interior. <clears throat> The domestic interior is the place where our lives take place, where we stage our history and memories, our activities and the representation of ourselves in everyday life, as in a theatrical play, arranging the spaces and gathering the objects that are essential part of our life, as in a personal intimate collection that becomes, eventually, a self-portrait of our personality. In 1934, Mario Prats published the book The House of Life. The book is the autobiography of Prats, 
a seminal Italian literary critic, art historian, essayist and art collector, whose most important publication in the realm of interior architecture, interior design and decoration, is La Filosofia dell'Arredamento, published in 1945 and translated in English in 1964 with the title An Illustrated History of Interior Decoration. Uh, the book, The House of Life, is the recollection of his memories narrated using the house in Palazzo Ricci in Rome as its framework and structure. In 1934, Prats and his wife moved from Liverpool to Rome, where he was hired as a professor of English literature and at Università La Sapienza. The couple lived in the house in Palazzo Ricci in Via Giulia, that Prats uh, furnished with an even growing collection of pieces of 18th and 19th century furniture and objects. Therefore, the house functioned as a blank canvas, an empty container, a stage capable to host the mise en scene of the objects and the fragments of Prats' life and memories, later collected in his book, The House of Life. The house had also the role of refuge, of shelter, and its be interior became a protection from the outside world, from the city, from his beloved Rome, at the time transformed into an expression of what Prats describes as the sad cases of modern Italy, with its, its development, not only urban, but also in taste and style, that in the name of modernization did not take into consideration the past and the history, and therefore made Mario Prats uncomfortable. This escape from the modernity of the city towards the interior of the domestic realm has been described by Walter J. Benjamin in his monumental The Arcade Project. Here, as scholar Charles Rice argues, the arcades of Paris represent the wedded advance of technology and commerce, the emblem of the modernizing city. Upholstery and textiles figure the domestic interior as a site of refuge from the city and its new alienating form of experience." End of quote. At the end of the 19th century, the outside world followed the new paths of industrialization and technology, or Benjamin expressed by the steel and glass architecture of the arcades, introducing new unexpected models, not only in the construction of the urban fabric, but also in the vision and interpretation of the world. The Impressionist and Expressionist and traditional representation of urban and natural environments, the abstract approaches in painting and photography developed between 1910s and 1930s by the avant-garde movements, the use of collage and montage as the privileged technique for the representation of the complexity of the metropolis celebrated by Sieg Siegfried Gideon are just a few of the contributions in this regard that pushed towards the critique of the traditional presence of the past, history, and memory as the foundational component of life and its expression. As a reaction to this overwhelming new world, the escape towards the interior was an invaluable option for the citizen. The shelter of domesticity and the life inside the house had expressed in the 19th century depiction of inhabited sections, multi-story residential buildings without facades that George Tissot calls, quote, exteriorized interiors, in which the building was represented as a dissected body, allowing the eye to penetrate its interior in order to study its life, its function, and its organs end of quote, where the everyday life in the interior, not inside the city, is depicted as lively vignettes populated by human figures acting in a sort of exposed theatrical stage inside each room. We can see Prats and his idea of the world and life as part of this narrative. Away from the street, away from the urban realm, away from the modern world, he collects his objects and narrates his life inside the house, the protagonist of his book, The House of Life. In the book, Prats describes seven rooms, and seven, as we know, were the parts which represented the whole human knowledge and history in Giulio Camillo's memory theater. 
Every room and object that Prats describes function as a memory place, as prescribed by Quintilian and Cicero. Histories are impressed in places and in the pieces collected, such as furniture, painting, statues, objects, and the rhetorical narration of his life takes the shape of a promenade architectural in the interior of the house. And one spot in Pratt's house seems to be almost a literal transfiguration of the Renaissance model. Pratt uh, writes, quote, if you stand in the doorway and look all around, you can see behind the dining room and beyond it, the flower stands in the hall, obliquely to the left, part of the bedroom, sideways to the right, beyond a further door, a portion of my daughter's room, and straight ahead, part of the study or drawing room. This, therefore, is a point of view which allows a general view of the rooms in all variety of their different colored wallpapers and in the richness of their furnishings." End of quote. Beside the hidden reference to Giulio Camillo, it is clear the theatrical aspect of the space. From here, the spectator, the inhabitant, visitor or guest, could admire the mise-en-scene of the whole house in its complexity and richness. But every room is a theater of memories, a collection of objects, a recollection of events, an opportunity to tell a story. In his daughter's Lucia's bedroom, a simple pedestal cupboard acquired from a person who lived in a street in Florence reminds Prats of his first excursion with his family as a child on a similar street of Tuscany. In the dining room, a collection of Vienna plates decorated with views of the Thames gives him the opportunity to recall an expedition on a yacht along that river. In the boudoir, the yellow settee reminds him of when he read to his friend Diamante La Venus Deal by Mary May, and all of a sudden they heard a distant thunder and then a whistle of a locomotive, and this made him recall a remote childhood memory of him and his mother traveling by train from Florence to Bologna. This last example is a recurring motif. The mise-en-scene of the objects in the interior becomes an, a mise en abim. The narration inside the narration, the memory inside the memory. He used this rhetorical technique at the end of the book, when he describes in the boudoir a convex mirror that reflects the interior space of the room. Quote, the rest of the room appears in miniature in the magic of the mirror. The chandelier, the portrait of the lady in white and the pictures, and the yellow settee, and the wall cabinet, and the person who looks into the mirror from the room appears reduced in size like the figure of the painter in a similar mirror, the first to be represented in a picture, the so-called Arnolfini portrait by Van Eyck. This person who looks into the mirror is myself, and this book I written is like a conspectus in a convex mirror of a life and, a, and, and a, of a house. I see myself as having myself become an object and an image, a museum piece among museum pieces already detached and remote." End of quote. In theatrical terms, this is the first coup de théâtre we find in the book. After the journey inside the seven rooms, the narrator, the storyteller, the actor, is transformed in one of the pieces of the collection, in one of the elements of the scenery. He has been transformed in memory himself, in his own personal theater. But 20 years later, another coup de théâtre is narrated in the 1976 revised edition of the book. One evening, Prats gets back to his house and sees that a tentative burglary happened. A few days later, there is another similar episode scary, but without any damage on or theft, that eventually, quote, changed the process. The house, as has, as using Pratt's words, that are called Bachelard, a project of the hero, lo lose its all meaning and importance. Transforming the house in a dead thing. The house of life becomes, all of a sudden, the house of death. Therefore, after this episode, Pratt decides to move from his beloved house in Palazzo Ricci to another apartment in Rome, in Palazzo Primoli. Before moving, the writer becomes a designer, 
He says, quote, I had a plan of the apartment. I calculated the available space in millimeters and drew the disposition of the pieces of furniture and of the paintings for each room, end of quote. On 20 sheets of paper, with precision and care, Prats draws every interior elevation of the new house with these beloved pieces of furniture, objects, and paintings. Adding notes and comments, trying to recreate the previous juxtaposition, even creating some new ones because of the different spatial arrangement of the place, the drawings are accurate for the base of each piece, placed with care in order to design the interior stage of the representation of this world and reinstall on the new shelf his theater of memory. With this surprising move, he wanted to detach his objects from the infected envelope and find a new theater for them, for his life, for his memories. In this process, the house, as using Pratt's world, they're called Bachelard, the projection of the ego, and the mirror of the spirit loses its meaning and importance. He lived in his house, in this new house, until he died in 1982. And now this is a museum, and as he desired. Pratt's book and house show us that we can travel the world and into the past without even leaving our room, using a metaphor of German historian Karl Schlögel. That's what Mario Pratt did room after room in his house, page after page in his book, where memory and history are staged as presence in everyday life. For himself and for us, spectators and participants of his theater of memory. Thank you. Proszę Państwa, też no, mamy tę sytuację um, well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, this speaker was with us online, so we can't ask any questions of Professor Martinelli. Uh, this paper was really very interesting. Let me just add a few comments. I can say that it was a very succinct yet profound reflection on the complexity of human psyche, of human needs. On the one hand, the need for memory, the need for reflection, the need for remembrance for something that uh, is the exact opposite of the avant-garde, but on the other hand, the need for the avant-garde, the need to rapture with what we are tackling with once we leave our refuge, our home refuge, where we collect the artifacts related to our memory. To me, this complexity lies in the fact that we need both. And uh, I believe that this is the true depth of the paper. So it was a very apt conclusion on the relationship between what's contemporary, what's modern and what's traditional, what's known, what we would like to keep in our direct proximity. And not always all of these things might be considered avant-garde. Let me add a short comment, and I hope that at the end of our session today we'll be able to discuss uh, the um, ideas uh, on avant-garde that we have presented here. So here we had um, a focus on a new context which is particularly relevant to our discipline. So we are not able to identify avant-garde in separation from the 
so-called background or context, which is based on theory and history. If we don't have this basic foreground, it is difficult to uh, evaluate the innovative quality of any gesture or thought. Okay, I believe we are ready to continue our meeting, and the meeting will go on for a while on site. So the first one to speak to us live is Professor Leszek Maluga from Wrocław, who will speak to us about Lebus Woods between avant-garde and science fiction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here and for offering me the opportunity to share with you my reflections on avant-garde. In my paper, I analyzed a case of, a, of an artist. And I attempted at defining the meaning of uh, an avant-garde artist. So 10 years have passed since the death of a great visionary and wonderful draftsman and unique intellectual Lebus Woods. Many critics considered him a representative of the avant-garde of the turn of the 20th and 21st century. The concept of avant-garde and as an adjective and as a noun uh, is used in two basic meanings. First, it refers to the avant-garde of art of the first half of the 20th century, which included new artistic movements. So it was about innovation um, going before or ahead any contemporary trends. And this is a new quality of a new creators, a new artists, and in this sense, Libius Woods is called an avant-garde artist. Therefore, a question arises, namely, to what extent this feature of Woods' creative activity is superficially attributed and to what extent the connection of his oeuvre with the essence of avant-garde art creating of the beginning of the 20th century can be proved. Comparing the feature of avant-garde art described by uh, Moravsky, a historian of um, arts and architecture with some of Woods' achievements, will allow us to verify their thesis, postulate suggesting that the among, among contemporary architects, Woods was the closest to the original roots of avant-garde. Avant uh, Moravsky was attempting uh, to look at this phenomenon in a synthetic way and identify the most important features of avant-garde movement. See, he lists four such features of the avant-garde trends, distance to the existing art, pioneering and innovation, this extraordinary perception of the world and art by refreshing it and search for unusual for the unusual at any cost which is a negative aspect of avant-garde but then Zygmunt Bauman described the Moravsky and uh, by um, listing six features. Pioneering spirit, distance and aversion to the existing art and its role in social life, despising the past, especially its canon, theorizing about one's own creative activity, treating art as the most advanced outpost of social progress, drawing inspiration from science and technology. And that aspect of avant-garde and its demonstration uh, allow us to wood, woods, uh, at, uh, intellect, at Woods' intellectual and creative activity and point it to its avant-garde values. One of the main and basic differences between avant-garde creative activity in art and architecture is the fact that artists can perform their work on their own, but implementation of architectural works require considerable costs and uh, will of investors and decision makers, and involves a lot of effort. But uh, here, architecture, um, free from uh, principles, economics, uh, uh, economic constraints um, and implementation conditions makes it possible uh, to go beyond the realities of professional practice. But note that this is not um, 
equivalent to avant-garde attitude to be anonymous. So, uh, avant-garde or new avant-garde are these concepts are reserved for specific trends at a specific time by art researchers. However, one can try to exploit populated to various creative attitudes, innovative, visionary, non-conformist, contesting, going ahead, not mentioning uh, other attributes. So, this is an avant-garde attitude. So, in 1980s, during the uh, exhibition of images and imaginaries of architecture at uh, Saint Pompidou, Peter Davy expressed the view that contemporary architecture would probably look different without this type of creative activity, which is a significant part of architectural heritage. Lewis Woods, Lewis Woods in 1970s, uh, uh, devoted himself entirely to developing his own concept of architecture. He broke up with the commercial design for the sake of drawing an intellectual work. He left behind him a huge number of drawings and models, and he also published dozens of books and published texts in the press. His concepts and views are incorporated into publications about future technologies and new paradigms of the civilization. His intellectual activity and position in the world of architecture are evidenced by the fact that he worked at or was temporarily invited to many leaders architectural uh, in or universities, and uh, also he was involved in organizing workshop at the Research Institute of Experimental Architecture, issued publications, recruiting collaborators, he actively animated events that linked his creative concept with problems and events related to modern civilization. He was a unique personality, uh, often described as an archetype, which can be regarded as appreciation for his unconventional, innovative, creative attitude. He worked out an individual way of practicing the profession of an architect, which was free from the requirement of the market game and the dictatorship of investors. He created space uh, organization concepts where commercial designers did not act as an architect. He was involved in in spatial situations in the areas of war, economic collapse, and natural disasters, namely when destruction and chaos required new types of space organization instead of rebuilding old orders. Uh, his more than 30 years of artistic work can be divided into three periods. In the first one, Woods began creating a vision of architecture in abstract spaces, Terra Nova, as a new theoretical order based on knowledge. Unis universe science which rejected determinism and Cartesian order and was based on a revolution in science caused by the theory of relativity. So here he developed the concept of experimental architecture that became a tool for all his creative activity. At the end of this period, he began to create works in the real context of cities such as Paris, Berlin and Zagreb. In the second period, in the 1990s, Woods worked were focused on very sensitive issues affecting mm, the architecture and urban space. He devoted a lot of work to uh, the war in the Balkans, uh, to the degraded uh, economically Havana in Cuba, and uh, San Francisco destroyed by the earthquake. So in this context mm, of destroyed and chaotic spaces, he developed the concept of unarchitecture and of radical reconstructions, mm, they refer to the activities we rejected the existing spatial order and traditional schemes of city and architecture functioning for the spontaneous bottom-up serve organization of people living in such areas. Such tactics uh, fit well into uh, a more universal concept of the architecture of resistance, um, partisan minority, which was uh, uh, um, against everything. In the past last period, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, until his death, would soften his revolutionary rhetoric. But with a new force returned to the roots of basing the concept of architectural activities on the scientific reflection, more theoretical design consideration and spatial experiments, well related to technological revolution and new paths of civilization. 
civilization development, and they began to dominate again. In his introduction to an interview with Woods, Jeff Monarch wrote, of course, Woods is usually considered the avant-garde of the avant-garde, someone for whom architecture and science fiction or urban planning and exhilarating and contained speculation are all but one and the same. His work is experimental architecture in its most powerful and politically provocative sense. So there are three periods that should be defined as um, alternate avant-garde periods. However, while Woods was appreciating uh, the creative work of other artists, uh, which were avant-garde uh, uh, works, he would uh, define himself as uh, not a member of such trends. His experimental architecture, revolutionary architecture, uh, would dissociate with any relationship with traditional or liberal consumer culture as well. So we have the concept of that uh, avant-garde concept. So pioneering spirit. Moravsky, when writing about the pioneering innovation as features of the avant-garde, draws attention to the distinction between a tendency towards otherness and unique achievements. In this sense, uh, the aforementioned fact of calling Woods an archetype by the professional community should be understood. He was a pioneer primarily early in new tactics in architectural practices, he saw an architect as an experimenter, author and mediator, making them intervention in a complex physical and social space and who was intellectually and politically engaged. He tried to connect his revolutionary spatial concept with the real problems of space places on Earth, which were in deep crises. Woods' creative activity innovative is innovative, despite some similarities to early achievements in the field of architecture. It is possible to show formal analogies in the first period of Woods' creative activity to architectural visions uh, and urban visions of 1960. There are also noticeable formal similarities to the early works of representations and the constructivism. Uh, however, Peter Neuvel brought about words. Of course, this, he's not a deconstructor, and he doesn't use the method of deconstruction uh, either as an excuse for laziness or an, as an authorization for an indifferent architectural expression. No. This stands an aversion to the existing art and its role in social art. When translating this feature of the artistic avant-garde into the area of architectural creative activity of Woods, note the critical attitude to the realities of design practice was probably a motive for departing from uh, it and accompanied him throughout his life, but he uh, wrote in 1990s, architecture has always served strength and power in society, was accused architects of conformism and servility. So the effect of him distancing himself from the capitalist spatial and professional reality was the creation of the concept of anarchitecture, a combination of the term architecture and anarchy. So are the architecture of resistance, rebellion and revolution. So he was for experimental architecture that looked for new forms of space organization for a free society, despising the past and, in particular, its canons. So past contemptive attitude can be regarded an important feature uh, representing the avant-garde and early and the manifesto on futuristic architecture in 1914 uh, distanced himself from the traditional architecture that was in force at that time, including pseudo-architecture of the avant-garde, classical architecture from imitation and reconstruction of ancient monuments and palaces from vertical and horizontal lines, cubic forms and pyramids. But in 1992, Woods wrote, 
an architect who designs types of buildings is a builder of pyramids, who imi imitates hidden forms previously written by those who dominate others and want to speak on their behalf, and who benefit from conven con conventions, conformism, and adaptations to the principles of normality. A year later, he renewed his attack on contemporary designers. In that case, the architects who monumentalize authority resisting change authority that seeks to maintain itself as the status quo are not to deserving civilization by its enemies. Categorization, oversimplification, and typology, he claimed that the only response to conventional commercial uh, architecture for the chosen people could be an architecture with all its philosophy and innovative spatial structures. Theorizing about own creativity. So, the avant-garde attitude uh, includes a reflection of one's own creative activity, from creative manifestos to st extensive studies about creative practice and theory, which showed great publishing activity in this regard uh, with his manifesto uh, that set out the direction for the re revolutionary concept 1993, and uh, 16 years later, Later, he published a slow manifesto on his blog. He included a collection of thoughts uh, summar summarizing his path of creating activity. He also created a unique form of theorizing about architecture, attributing thoughts and views to a fictional architect called Baltus or Holtz. His drawing and essays were published in 1999, treating art as the most advanced outpost of social progress. In many of his works, Woods expressed his belief that architecture can be a tool of social changes. He considered a shift away from the existing practices and forms of space organization in favor of a revolutionary paradigm based on new forms of architecture. In one of the interviews, he said, Architecture should not be just something that follows up on events, but the leader of events. By implementing an architectural action, you, one actually makes a tra transforms the social fabric. Architecture becomes an instigator. It becomes an initiator. Criticizing the current state of civilization leading towards an economic degradation of certain regions, he saw in animating grassroots uh, self-organization a way to create a new spatial and social tissue. Old compromised structures should not be reconstructed by no new revolutionary tactics and uh, should be introduced to success society. Among the main concepts of the new organization of spatial, uh, social space, he included heterarchy as the opposite of the hierarchy dominating in the contemporary world, drawing inspiration from science and technology. Initially, he was fascinated by um, a revolution in science and especially with Einstein's theory of relativity. In this context, he was interested in the dynamics, uh, processes and becoming. So Schwartz uh, later on wrote uh, that even if I cannot take seriously of all the mysticism in which Woods dresses up his defensive speech to accept the unknown, I think Peter Cook is right when he writes about Woods' work that architecture since the death of Buckminster Fuller urgently needs someone who will think again a little more, a little more universally about the world and its meaning through light and air, through time and space. Indeed, Woods is supplementing his project with texts referring to scientific theories. He added glossaries containing scientific terms and neologism he created, and he referred to scientists. And in his um, creative work, he um, turned experiments as a strategic element. And he referred to buildings and cities as living laboratories.
Summarizing, if we assume that the definition of an architect as being avant-garde is conditioned by the fulfillment of the constitutive features, at least to a large extent of the avant-garde, then Woods deserves the definition more than any contemporary star architect. That, as shown, uh, his work is based on the avant-garde uh, concept. Uh, so, uh, pro his professional uh, concept, his uh, um, aspects uh, are an isolated phenomenon. However, Woods developed a large independence, uh, which on the one hand allowed him to boldly formulate views, and also, on the other hand, to achieve the position of an authority in a professional environment. And he was a class in a class of his own. However, he did not create an avant-garde direction in contemporary architecture similar to the trends from the beginning of the 20th century, or it's hard to assess it right now. His trends and ideas are followed out by a small group of his professional friends and students. Woods did not accept the concept of honor and guard if it's in his additional understanding, but he was a unique visionary and had a sense of mission. All of his over 30 years of activity proved that he actively participated in various areas of professional life and created an original architectural program from difficult time. In this regard, he was a pioneer and innovator, but also a rebel and revolutionist, therefore he fully deserves the name of an avant-garde architect. Professor, thank you so much. I suggest that we leave questions, if there are any, to the Q&A part, which is to happen quite soon. I think we'll remember. Professor, your excellent paper, a great example of uh, using uh, the works of Woods to explain and illustrate many interesting observations uh, about the avant-garde. And also, thank you so much for introducing these precise concepts and definitions of uh, avant-garde as such. Thank you once again. And now, without further ado, Lamberto Amistadi, Professor Al Am Lamberto Amistadi from Bologna will present us with, uh, present us, uh, with his uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am happy to be here for the first time in, in, in Krakow. And uh, thank you for the topic. It's very challenging, it's very difficult, but interesting. Um, I, uh, we have already heard a lot of definition of avant-garde, and so I, I, I can add one <laughs> by me. By, by me. Uh, I don't uh, want to approach the question of the avant-garde in this opposition between tradition and avant-garde. I prefer the definition by uh, John Dewey, who, who, who say that the, there is no difference of quality between avant-garde and tradition, but just a difference of time. It is very interesting, a difference of time. The time of the avant-garde is the time of the strategy, is the time of the syntactical turn. The time of the composition, the syntactical turn is a, is a very amazing concept, concept by Eva Lembois in a book, Painting as Model, who speaking about Mondrian, spoke about this question of the, of the syntactical turn. But the thesis is the space, the, the, the space of the composition, the space of the repetition, the space of the variation, the space of the transfiguration, the space of the com combination. The thesis we see here, the, a, a famous image, this is Man Ray and Francis Picabia playing chess, yeah? If you know the painting of Francis Picabia, Francis Picabia uses all simple, all the same elements 
but combining them in a different way. This is another interesting issue, this question, all to find out all the possibilities of the variation. Uh, and, uh, and this space of the composition is a formal space. This question, this concept of formal space is too born in the time of the historical avant-garde in, in the 20 years. Because formal space is this concept of, by Rudolf Carnap. You know Rudolf Carnap is all the, that uh, studies about the structure of the language. Yeah, of course, we could say that this, this formal space, this compositional space is a space, the deep space of the structure. But this space, this formal space has many levels of depth. <laughs> this is another invention of Noam Chomsky, for example. We all were, all, all, always uh, hear, hear about deep structure and uh, surface structure. But deep, this deep structure is made by many levels. So I want to do just some example of this uh, space of the articulation, but this difference between um, the, the two levels of this formal space was made in the 20 years uh, before, in the, the 17, by Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin was already quoted by my friend Patricia Martinelli, who I want to say hello on the, on the internet. But this is, we could say that the substance of the world is crossed by two sections, the longitudinal section of painting and the cross section of certain forms of drawing. The longitudinal section would seem to have a representative function and in some way contains things. The cross section is symbolic. It contains the signs. This is the reason of my, of my mind subtitle, yeah? Praxis without representation. But there is not a position between, between representation and this symbolic space. It, it is just a difference, difference of time. Yeah. So I want to do three examples about uh, this question of the articulation of the things and about this idea to do experience of all the possibilities this idea of all the possibilities is another idea strong in the avant-garde time because if you think the music of Schoenberg, the composition with 12 tonen, yeah, the dodecaphonic music, the idea of Schoenberg was to don't repeat one note until you have done experience of all the other 11 notes. So this is the idea of this uh, uh, faith in the, in, the, in, the, in the heart, in the, in the architecture, autonomy of the heart and the architecture, because the autonomy was another awareness uh, reached in the time of, of the avant-garde, and this constructive procedures or syntactic strategic model. The first example is the example of John Aiduk. Uh, I called this example Transfiguration. Uh, John Aiduk, uh, it is for me, this is American architect, it's very interesting because uh, he worked like Picabia with few elements, typological elements, like in this case, the, the, the stair, the, the, the step stair of the theater. Uh, taken by the example of Villa Malaparte in, in, in Capri, because this funnel form, yeah, this funnel form, funny and funnel form. So. But in this theater, for example, pantomime theater, John Eduk in one page described all the possibilities of, of this very simple element. We have the same element doubled in two different directions. And we have that theater with a lot of people, of a lot of audience, and just one actor. Or we can have the contrary, one people, one audience, and many actors. Yeah? And then more, we can use this theater above, 
or we can use this theater in the space below. So we have all the possibilities. And then John Eduk went on with this example because we could double on diagonal and we could have something in the air and the same mirror figure underground. And doing the transfiguration, the, the, the interesting thing is that it, uh, the functional program changing, change. And so there is this interesting question about how stressing the typological traditional elements, we can stress the functional program. One pupil of him uh, called him, what do you mean with program? Because John Eduk spoke always about program, 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 new program. Ma, you, do you mean functional program or philosophical program? He answered both. And so, in this case, we can add another specific uh, uh, idea of the avant-garde. For, for example, the paradox of the Dada avant-garde and the irony. In this case, the double figure of the theater, what is this a swim pool? But the swim pool is tri triangular, both in the plan and in the section. And so, when you start to swim, you, are, you reach a point when to swim is impossible because the water is too shallow. Of course, this idea, this idea of uh, this idea of the, the two doublings, two double, and two of the inversion of the contraposition of the same things have one philosophical and ethical issue too, because in this little project by him, Judge states the same element of the stairs is doubled on the one chair. One judge is sitting, and the other chair, and the other, and deep in that chair, there is who is judged. But at last, the judge and who is judged are the same, just in the opposite condition. Yeah. The, uh, the second example is, uh, is about uh, this architect. Luciano Semarani, already quoted by Patrizio Martinelli. <laughs> so I want to say hello again to Patrizio Martinelli. The Luciano Semarani. Because uh, in that idea of the composition, but in that idea of the avant-garde, there is the idea of the linguistic game. The idea of the game. You know, the, the idea of the linguistic, linguistic game was born in the same 20 years, or, on the past century, and was... Uh, um, uh, carried home by Ludwig, Witt Ludwig Wittgenstein. Yeah? The idea is that the compositional play, your, your compositional game is based on rules. And so in the last time of his life, Luciano Semerani read again a list of rules on this old project. This is the project for, for the Municipio di Osopo, the, the, the house of the municipality in Italy made in the 79. But a lot of years later, Luciano Semerani established just the rules for a game, for a linguistic architectonical game. And so the rules were elimination of materiality in the elements of the architectural construction, the assumption of the curved line as an eruption in the order and narrative, the principle of the Matryoshka, the Russian doll, that contains inside other dolls that are all the same but increasingly smaller. That is the interlocking of boxes of different size within a single formal configuration. The disembowelment of the buildings that produces the urban interior by staging their own internal building organs. There is very avant-garde in the, in, the, in the sense of the data and the parasitic way of, for example, Adolf Loos, who was 
strictly friend of the poets and the artists of the of his time. Yeah. So we have a bit the same rules, defined rules that uh, all the, 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 the rules is est what are established playing with single simple elements but composing them in different way. And we have to this idea of the Matrioska that we already have seen in, the, in other presentation. The idea to, to put something inside something else. The last, the, 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 the other example is this example about the difference between this dif two different time of the representation of the things and the and the, uh, this symbolic time of the process. We could speak about the stairs, yeah, in two ways. This is the stair where the stair is something finished completed at the end of the process. This is a beautiful drawing of Gigetta Tamaro. The cat who arises the, the tail tell us the end of the stair. So we have the stair as a completed, finished thing in a representative way. In this idea of John Eduk, the stair is not a finished thing, but the stair is a process. Have you ever read the article on the Bonaparte House? That is something to do with your question. This is the beginning of it, of it all. It is a wall from the horizontal to the vertical, abstract. This is very clear definition of the, of the abstraction of the avant-garde, but especially of this idea of the avant-garde like a, pro a process. And so the state there is something like the cut complete, finished. In this idea of the stair, the stair is the passage from the horizontal to the vertical. And this is um, uh, a rezoning very uh, frequent in the avant-garde drawing, like for example in the, Pol in the Poland uh, in the Poland, the avant-garde uh, painter, yeah, Streminski, was the, the, you know, I think, Katarina Kobler and Streminski, with this, this architectural composition, where in the painting, this process is, is represented. This is the paradox. It's praxis without representation, but at last, in this painting, the process is represented. Yeah, so it's not, it's not real, what I said before. <laughs> Or it's the same, this, all the sketches, a lot of sketches by Paul Klee in this idea of the figuration. Yeah, you know, for him, Gestalt is the way to, to, to lead to the form. We have the form, the steady, the fixed form, and we have the way to lead to the form. Um, and so this idea of the stairs was fascinating. You know Adolf Loos too, in these sketches for the Mexico City Tone, all competition in this time of the process. We have different examples of stairs with different, with different um, harmonic proportion because this uh, space, formal space, was this time of the composition, the time of the process is strictly related to the composition in the music. Yeah. It is not a case that we say composition in painting, composition in architecture, composition in music. Of course, we in Italy, we are teaching composition, not design. We like to, to say it every, every time. <laughs> architectural composition. <laughs> and so, uh, this is the, the, the last, uh, another example of this idea, to compose always with the same elements, but changing the size and changing the position. Stressing 
the typological object in all is possibility. So we have the famous uh, tower for, of, by Adolf Loos for the Chicago Tribune competition with this big, this great column. It is over the basement, the block of the basement. But we could imagine to, <laughs> to change the size of the column and the change the position of it. And so, and so we can imagine a lot of, a lot of a changing in the typological universe and a changing in the program. In what direction? It is not so important because we can imagine a lot of function for the same configuration. Or another funny data operation by Jonedo is this idea to stress the object in all the possibilities. In this case, the possibility is try using the section, one section, like a plan, like a plan. This is the, the, the experiment, of course. In the avant-garde space, there is always this experimental component. That's it. But this is the idea of the inversion, but the inversion is, in this case, inside the space of, of the representation. What is, normal, what is normal using like a section is used, in this case, like, like a plan and what happened in the typological universe. Yeah. And so I, I just enjoy to, to try all the the, 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 the subs, the subs, the, the, what happened when I, when I do this changing, yeah? So to conclude, uh, I was, I, I'm interested to underline this, this, this question, this different section of the world, the representative and the, and the time of the process. This idea to, in the avant-garde too, to use all the same things, but combinating in different way. I like to, to quote the Roland Barthes, Roland Barthes sentence, who say that originality is not doing new things, but composing old things in a new way. This is the originality. And so I think that it is a game, a linguistic game, it is a play, and I think we should enjoy to, to have this experience of the combination game. Or maybe, I quote, I, I, I quote now, Raffaella Neri, who, speak, who spoke about happiness. Maybe it could be a happy game. Thank you. Bardzo dziękujemy panu profesorowi za Thank you. Thank you, professor, for this very interesting paper presentation and a completely different approach to avant-garde and innovation in architecture that you concluded with an interesting quote from Bart. Yes, that innovation is just combining elements that already exist, but in a new innovative way. I believe that architecture as life itself has always always been a game, it is a game in space and well, the first slide you showed us was a chess game and as in life certain moves cannot be repeated but in architecture you can make some things anew starting from a scratch and go ahead in this way. Okay, so maybe I will add one more thought that came to my mind. What drew my specific attention in your paper was the fact that you extended this catalog of uh, the symptoms of avant-garde uh, and I'm referring here from your conclusions uh, from the case studies and my own conclusions. So I believe that a symptom that would allow us to recognize the avant-garde nature of thought is paradox, right? So paradox in architecture may mean an attempt to freeze certain procedural 
um, aspects or just the opposite to activate certain permanent states. I believe that this is something that belongs to our own craft, that belongs to our own competence, because whenever we draw our own buildings and whenever something uh, atypical happens in this process, our stability is being shaken. The stability of our architectural associations is somehow interrupted and it's also typical of avant-garde movement, I believe, yes. Right, so maybe we will go ahead uh, because we are nearing the end of our conference today and this final, this final paper for today is the uh, paper by Renato Capozzi, Professor Capozzi from uh, Naples, and it will be presented online. It is entitled Form versus Antiforms Shapelessness. To illustrate the diacrisis between the two terms, form and antiforms, shapeless forms, in the title, isn't it an easy challenge? It's enough to say that the fist is unknown, deliberately kept in the singular, and the second one, an adjective rendered in the plural. In uh, apparently paradoxical terms, it should be noted that while in the notion of form, it's find a very wide plurality of meanings and articulation. In fact, of shapeless, this multiplicity of declination is notably reduced, although there are positions which have underlined to propulsive potential opposed to unusual limiting designation for the name. Starting from the etymology, on the level of etymological ascents, the term form is reference to Greek and Latin origin, often signification not only distant and multiple, but sometimes opposed. For the Greek, there were many ways to designate the concept of form. Eidos, intelligent form, I idea, form, the team idei, or C, a idolon, image, idol, double, apparition, illusion, spectre. Pragma, shaped team form, Rhythmos, form, sequence, disposition of part in a wall, affine to reo, scroll, or morphe, sensitive form, outward appearance, or tropos, affine to prebo, term, use with use, other use, schema, way in which I think of course. In Latin, forma takes the meaning of form appearances, beauty and derives, in addition to the resonance of morphe, from verb foreign, which has the meaning of hold, support, contain, or using the root tar, from which the Greek taranos. That means stable, fixed figure, and so on. For this ancestry, the terms would denote an external figure of the matter or the way of disposition in parts of things, but also a model to give the matter a determinated figure. If the Greek articulates the meaning of form into many names with a gradation from the abstract ideal plan to the dissolutive consequence of Plato, 
of pure and truly real concept insensibly and illusion manifestation of image passing through description of waves of scenes flowing shaping in a form and concrete and external manifestation in which the matter is configured conversely the latent derivation even if it contains some inconsistencies in the volatility of the prefix far prefer action on the matter to determine a regimentation conformation by ordered and regulated disposition based on the verified models capable of producing producing beauty and conformity of external apparatus the modern definition of the term with the ambiguities and the, the ambiguities and semantics shift that can be imagined in fact, the heat word form is a very general way that denotes the appearance of an object sufficient to characterize it externally. Way. In the current acceptation, one can find various similar words such as figure from Latin figura. And above all, as Victorio Hugo points out, image from Greek, a con. This is synonym generate quite a few misunderstandings, considering the fact that the, an architectural work has an image, but don't authorize it to be reduced only an image. Since its values lies almost exclusively and its ability to refer completely to a form as a diagram through the appropriate codification. The origin of the word shapeless is of a completely different kind, while on the hand, if it is of more recent formation, free stall of 40th century, and on the other hand, it has no origin, another Latin informis, derivated by forma with negative prefix in. By connecting this truth to the terms amorpho, it arrives at Greek amorphos as a sharpness denoting what is without a definitive, a definite form amorphous but The sharpness is therefore that which has noting this thing in this structure. It is interesting to note how the verb in form that shares with a sharpness and an etymological construction similar instead alludes to giving form to instructing how give structure to something doesn't yet have it. Uh, on the aesthetic and the philosophical and the theoretical, theoretical level, the multiple values of the terms forms assume the sense of ordering principle that gives, that gives unity and coherence to a multiplicity of the elements. While for Plato, from his primary essence idols and the case of phenomena, and which have an imperfect copy, with, however, it's possible through our progressive abstraction to make intelligible the authentic sense. For Aristotle, preferring Morphe over idols, form is inextricably like to the matter representing it efficient and final chaos, assuming nevertheless a logical primacy as of everything it can speak because it has form and not for its 
material appearance as such. Quoting. Two different directions we have. That Plato, that, that of an idea produces sensitive images from which it's possible to intuit the essence behind. And Aristotle, that in the physics recognize the dynamics between form and matter up to the final synthesis in absolute form disconnected from the mat. The Aristotelian option will recalled by both St. Thomas in applying to the matter a signatura in Latin that reveals the divine presence and by Hegel in the concept of absolute spirit from Kant, remarking on the ordering role of form in a transcendental sense, the pure forms of intuition become condition of the possibility of the code of knowledge, in which matter is be understood and quotation, that which correspond to a sensation and form that for which the multiply and the phenomenon can be ordered by a priori. Analogously, intellects are determined by reason, I think, in a synthetic formal terms. If the setting of Cassidian and Panosky in Cantarian growth assumes the symbolic form as unifying principles of a multiply and indistinct shapeless that that has to serve phenomenology allowing an epoch in which it puts brackets the world spending the judgment of the existence of things is connected with Plato in the consideration that phenomena must be investigated in their manifestation in order to grasp their nominal essence. The psychological acquisition of Gestalt are of different size that in articulated rules of percent will investigate the way of understanding and conceptualization of the form. The post-structuralist, post Derrida, Deleuze, Lyotard, on the contrary, this solves, starting from the negation of the receipt on Nietzsche's and Heideggerian presupposition, and which the concept of difference, the investigation on articulation of logocentric structure in incessant in practice, of the deconstructionism, postmodernism, relativism, through the hermeneutics of the text. On the aesthetic level, the form coincides with the outward appearance of things that envelops and forces the like and habitus and can only be beautiful in the sense of over all the lie completed and but in Hegel aesthetic the form is assumed as quotation the sensitive appearance in which idea is exterior itself and the measure of its adaptation to the idea content will also be as in classical art the measure of its adaptation to the beauty We have to underline the distinction, well, no distinction, between ideo ideographic human science and nomothetic natural science science. In morphological, morphogenetical approach, form assumes as an organism to be studied to invariance and transformation and in good represents quotation, something that moves, becomes, 
passes, the theory of form is a theory of metamorphosis. The passage, intuitive, but not empirical, between the theme form basis, you phenomenon, true variation allows the process of formation, building, 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 and defines morphogenetic as an incessant qualitative increase. The form in this ex exegesis and after each will not, as a paraiso points out, be more as criminal to internal and external schematism, but to the form forming, form format, embryo and actual state. Also, the Gestalt will recover in a platonic sense for which beauty returns to be a synonymous which order some Goetheian notion in the identification of totality as not residual to the source of its part. On the wake of Goetheian morphology, its development, it will arrange on one side the structuralist hypothesis outlined above and on the other the biological naturalistic hypothesis of living and geometry world. Uh, with a reference for Plato Timaeus and in the position of, assumed by René Thorne, passing through the phenomena of self-presentation, exploring a construction and construction creativity similar to the concept of mimicry of camouflage. A relevant singularity is represented to the formal theory of, by Henri Fossillon in which his work is, quotation, is an attempt towards the unique, its a film itself, is a work as an absolute and at the same time is a part of a system of complex relationships, its matter of spirit, its form and content, and arise from an active encounter between the formal vocation of man and the formal vocation in the mind, of the mind. In, its, in the, his uh, book, V des Four, the connection between forms and life is expressed following Balzac. In, the, in this assertion, quotation, life is form and form is word of life. And the work doesn't exist as a form, without a form. A form that in all its fullness is assumed as construction of space and matter which manifests itself as the balance of the masses where the form can become a formula or rule that is an abrupt and rest, an exemplary type but it's primarily a mobile life in a changing world. For Adorno, in conclusion of this relation with Aesthetica, uh, he says, what an artist can say, he says only by giving a form. And in the same line, Luigi Paraiso, in his Teoria della Formatività, the says, stated that form is the success of a process of formation. The triumph of shadows. Uh, this search of stability of form corresponds in recent years to the progressive revelation of the shapeless and as transgression of form, but also as a promise, as a possibility. In aesthetic context, from futurism to art brood, to the informal, in the avant-garde, right, where the shapeless is an art or two, therapy, no longer defined by the form, but by its antithesis. 
At the same time, on the theoretical level, the thesis by Josh Bate argues that Shapless serves to downgrade and to transgress the form, to desublimate it be it be able to try a new process. The sample of Shapless is in his book documents. In fact, he writes, state quotation, Shapless additional world starts from the moment in which it no longer gave the sense, but the task of the world. So Shapless is not just an objective with meaning, but a terms that serve to downgrade requiring in general that everything has its form. What does he need has no rights of his own in any sense, and it is crucial everywhere, like a spider or a near war. This obscure definition, prediction, in our opinion, is contradicted by the reflection of poet Paul Valéry, who in the Degastans the same, observing the floor on which the ballet dancer are reflected states. It's something true of the sharpness. There are things, spots, contour, volumes, in certain way that existing the fact that are only perceived by, the, by us, but not known. We cannot reduce them to a single law. They do stand for from analysis of their facts. Reconstruct them with logical operation. We can modify them with feeling. They have no other propriety than to occupy an area of the space. To say that they are shapeless things, and not to say that they have no form, but their form is do not find in us anything that allows us to replace them with a precise sign that you trace an uncertain recognition. And in fact, the shapeless form have no other memory that, than that of a possibility no more than a series of notes does not give rise a melody, a puddle, a rock, a cloud, a piece of shoreline, are not reducible, analyzed. If the shapeless form as refined for Bate is met in first giving sine una struttura or scheda, for Valerie, for this indeterminate and unanalyzable condition, it's a loss to mere possibility of being informed. A possibility that, uh, in fact, remains uncertain without an ordering action. The works of an art is the creation, he says, Valerie. It's a construction in which analysis and calculation and planning conduct the main whole. Only different interpretation of these two texts is possible to derive a corresponding dialectic between the modern and the postmodern, as defined in the opposite corpus proposed by the philosopher Imam Hassan. The distinction between form, conjunctiva, closet, and anti from this teeth open can be attributed to the copeless hypotax, paratax, root deep, resolve surface, origin, cause, difference or difference, trace, and of course, meaning and significance. If we want to uh, pass to the architecture, uh, this consideration allows us, in a conclusion, to apply this antinomies to the architectural discourse, trying to show how the dialectic between form and sharpness, form 
It's at the base of a progressive and afflictive virtualization and the realization of architectural artifacts in a perspective that some have called post -human. In this sense, Peter Eisman unexpectedly, in a say of 1963, towards the um, understanding of form in architecture, on, in architectural design, is appeared, uh, reflecting on the formal foundation of architecture, goes on to formulate an architectural equation where the identify terms, concept, or intent, function, structure, techniques, and form ultimately interact, where form represents a magnitude above all order, because architecture essentially gives form. Quotation. The form can be can be generic platonic, linear or centroidal, or specific, and referring to the vague definition of configuration or connection between parts and whole, Eisenman considers it necessary to introduce the notion of moment and comprehensibility, for which the needs of formal clarity and inequivocal reference to archetypal solids become even more urgent. Contrary to the stability and the clarity of the form of the classical and the modern tradition connected to essential relationship with construction, in these years of reduction ad imaginem, we assist programmatically renouncing to any form of correlative syntax to the complete disarticulation between image and form, the first responsible for the seductive aggression, in a way a sort of avant-garde or retro -quartz, to the sense, and the second related to a precarious hyperformalism that has its counterparts in the technological exhibition in open related access of form in reference to a dubious neo naturalism To this construction of system of hierarchies between the part hypotaxis is substituted by a parataxis from far the at least by Aldo Rossi, becomes the flight disconnecting and metamorphic. In search of the root, both in the sense of foundation of a stability, original causation of form, it contrasts with the concept of rhizomatic proposed by Deleuze, multiply and agglutinated fastening that predeceased the dissolution of the space in between and distorted surface, that breaking the necessary bound with the construction level, become a mere support of advancing and marketing messages. Shirtless forms, which far from expressing through the form of character of work, as the implementation of the theme of meaning, be the very furious of the signifier, identifically the fair, their condition of reality, producing no more than trace of inadequate notes capable to the mind, certainly not melodic harmonies, but nothing but noise, decomposition and chaos. Thank you for your attention.
Proszę Państwa, no, znowu niestety nie możemy... So, ladies and gentlemen, again, we cannot have questions to the speaker because, but I think that we may approach this very deep philosophical uh, lecture as a certain summary of our struggle with avant-garde. So, if so, so I open the floor for discussion. We strongly um, encourage you to comment on our two-day meeting. If you do not have any comments, any questions, we'll try to start it. Uh, Takie dwie myśli, by ourselves on our own. Naszych rozważań. So I have uh, some uh, concepts, some thoughts, some observations from today and yesterday. So my observation is that very often avant-garde is connected with a breakthrough. Bez tego trudno nam uzyskać poczucie awangardowości. And otherwise we cannot have that avant-garde notion of feeling of thought. So it's about crossing the borders of our standards of our referatów, które tego dotyczyły. Ale way of working, but avant-garde is also about moving beyond the borders, going beyond the borders of some concepts, some metaphysical concepts. So, so it's about perception of our environment, of what surrounds us. So it's about uh, looking at uh, certain uh, limits of architecture. So we had uh, certain concepts of uh, architecture, uh, uh, mathematical models, psychological uh, uh, concepts. We use them all to explain our perception. So transgressions, um, it's about uh, avant-garde uh, structures, buildings, which uh, um, uh, undermine what we believe is cannot be undermined and sometimes it's about changing responses to certain spatial uh, concepts. So this is my first observation that avant-garde is, is about going beyond limitations. And my second observation which is also based on what I heard uh, yes, today, and that is also my message to you. So avant-garde is about the condition of the status of theory. We have this conference, and uh, we're very grateful to uh, this uh, Krakow uh, uh, members of the academia. And with this conference, we can introduce some structure where organize our thoughts, thoughts which uh, circle around uh, chaotically uh, sometimes. So it is about defining the space in architecture. It is about uh, inventing a new order uh, that allows us to have a better and deeper understanding of planning concepts. So avant-garde is about uh, the it's a definition of a status of theory, and it refers to what we have as professionals. A moment ago, Professor Amistadi, he quoted Schoenberg as an avant-garde composer, and that prompted me um, towards uh, the intention to share an observation with you. The school invented by Schoenberg used to be called uh, Viennese 
a neoclassicism. And Professor referred to that type of uh, Kant, creative concept com uh, of composition. So no sound is repeated in a sequence, but there were four different rules. And actually, it's worth remembering that Schoenberg, Schoenberg was not the inventor. So actually, that is that concept is based on the medieval chorale and Bach works are also based on that concept. And Schoenberg only only recycled or upcycled that concept. In the theory of music, certain um, phenomena that we consider avant-garde, they have. Uh, they have come with a rich background. And this is why we have this impression of innovation. In the field of architecture, it is often that we are overturning the table. So if we have something which is avant-garde in nature, it uh, breaks with all that has been done so far and to the full. So we also had some references to uh, tradition in our paper. So these are my observations. So perhaps anyone would like to share their observations with us. Yes, so maybe I would add something. Uh, professor mentioned words, and I was wondering whether we are really in the right to call conceptual artists architects. So these conceptual artists create visions for architecture. Obviously, Woods was a practitioner. He worked with Salinen, but at some point he decided to cross the bridge and he proposes his visions, visions, and we have a variety of artists in the history of architecture that we treat as architects or as artists, avant-garde artists, who are called architects or artists. I believe the situation is more complex in the case of architects who do not shape a space in practice and they uh, remain in this virtual conceptual field. And the second question emerges, it's pretty easy to define the uh, moment when avant-garde appears, when it breaks with the reality, but how long does it last? It uh, this, some, somehow spreads the new branches, the avant-garde branches out, and it's difficult to define the point when the avant-garde ends. It's easy to uh, identify the point where it starts, but when something, nothing new starts, where does the uh, avant-garde end? And referring to the title of the final presentation, of the last presentation, many of the publications that we have in our book are deeply philosophical, and I believe that we could paraphrase at this point for versus anti-form as to be or not to be of the avant-garde and of innovation. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me add just a few words of reflection on the basis of notes that I made today and yesterday. So let me start with two elements related to avant-garde, with uh, creativity, because we, when we talk about avant-garde and about creativity, we talk about the creator and the addressee. Well, the word avant-garde refers mostly to creators. I haven't heard anything about avant-garde recipients, spectators. The avant-garde is about fighting, fighting against the popular taste, against the popular tradition against this collective memory, uh, against the habits, customs of the recipients that 
uh, are to be converted into these avant-garde illuminated citizens even though they may be quite resistant to this process and the second thing that i find important is the difference between architecture and other arts we have uh, talked about it about the fact that the arts are intertwined but let me point out to one important thing when we look at an avant-garde painting or we listen to avant-garde music at every point we may just turn off the music or just uh, uh, to take the painting of the wall we can't do this with architecture we are in a way destined or we are sentenced to live with art architecture even the avant-garde architecture so here we return to the concept of creative freedom because creative freedom is um, uh, irreversibly linked to avant-garde this is what avant-garde is about, to uh, externalize art artistic freedom, to break the chains of tradition, of this fossilized tradition. But the question is, is it the freedom for the creators, for the artists, or for the recipients, for the audience? And these two things uh, contradict each other, and in a philosophical way, but I believe that philosophers would be able to handle this uh, dilemma, especially, especially Friedrich Hegel, who said that if thesis and facts contradict reality, well, uh, the reality loses and uh, he had a lot of followers including in politics and um, we were talking about stalinist architecture but at this point the architecture of this period may be seen as a fragment of the freedom that was supposed to liberate uh, the people who are in darkness and make them ever happy as a result of this underlying philosophical approach but obviously we do appreciate we appreciate the achievements of avant-garde and its contribution to architecture to the arts but as we have already said how long can for how long can you be avant-garde when avant-garde becomes becomes the winner who has um, conquered the habits and the past. It seems that the avant-garde artists, avant-garde creators, strongly propped, supported by artistic criticism, they used to, and today they also partially set the tone for what is happening around us. So you need to be quite daring, quite audacious to go against the avant-garde. But these creators, they seem to be giving up their spot on the stage to another significant being. That is the audience. In my view, the audience of today start playing a greater role. Why? As a result of transformations in our networked society. Today it is the network, the internet, that starts to rule the minds of the public. It is in the internet that the most avant-garde ideas are being born and they are being born quite unexpectedly, spontaneously. When you think about fashion, I, and I'm referring to clothes, creators start uh, pursuing so-called cool hunting, so searching for novelties that emerge unexpectedly, spontaneously, 
in the network society, in the virtual society. In my view, the future of the avant-garde is in the net, in the internet to the trends that are being born there unpredictably, spontaneously. And the creators that were put on the pedestal of the avant-garde the, in the past uh, become subordinate to these trends that spread over the internet. If they uh, fail to follow these trends, they will be eliminated from the market because today the, net, the needs the marketing, obviously, that creates such needs, they determine professional success. So this is my brief reflection on the concept of avant-garde, its recent history, maybe its future. And let me at this point thank the organizers, Professor Kozłowski, obviously, for creating such an inspiring original title and topic for us. Okay, so let me just add my thanks for the entire team, for Anna Mielnik. We should give thanks to her because she is handling us and assists us in all sorts of issues that we are confronting. Thank you very much. We are very grateful. We are also grateful for the hospitality and for the fact that you are always creating this very unique atmosphere that is so conducive to our discussions. I don't know if anybody else would like to add anything. Professor, you should join us here at the very end at least. Come to the stage. Bardzo dziękujemy raz jeszcze. Thank you, Pozwolę thank sobie you nic nie dorzucać do myśli, że chyba wszystko well, zostało powiedziane. Ja chciałem bardzo podziękować wszystkim uh, uczestnikom, delegentom, mam nadzieję, że osobom oglądającym na internecie. Dlatego, że oczywiście bardzo dziękuję, że to wielki trud był oczywiście zorganizowanie tej konferencji. Nie będę się krygował, ale pamiętajmy, że konferencja nie może istnieć bez osób, które napisały artykuły do książek i do wielkich mówców, którzy do nas mówili. Istnieje tylko dlatego, co roku przyjeżdżają i mam nadzieję, że tak jeszcze przez wiele lat. Ja co prawda nigdy nie ukrywam, zawsze mówimy, że to jest ostatnia konferencja. Przynajmniej mówimy tak przez miesiąc, dopóki nam się nie staramy się organizować następną. Mam nadzieję, że uda się zrobić następną. Będziemy mogli Państwa znowu gościć, a Państwo zaszczycą nas swoimi świetnymi wykładami, świetnymi tekstami, którymi możemy się chwalić jako organizatorzy skromni, bez uczestnictwa. Humble organizers who wouldn't be here without you. So you are. This applause is for you. So when, if everything has been said, everybody is tired. Following these two days, let me officially announce that the conference will be postponed until the end of the official part of this conference. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very